Welcome to our spring 2021 curatorial talks. And it is also part of Re Binghamton University's research days for 2021. So I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. I wanna talk a little bit about housekeeping, introduce what this program is gonna to be tonight. And then I'm gonna get out of the way and let folks uh, actually see uh, who they came to see, which is the, the students speaking. So tonight, the way the structure is going to be set up is our four curatorial interns from last fall will be presenting on the exhibitions that are currently in the lower galleries of the Binghamton University Art Museum. Each of them will have about 10 minutes to present their work. As they're presenting, if there are questions that occur to you, you're welcome to put them into the chat. I will be moderating that and keeping an eye on it. And then we will have about five minutes per student for you to ask any questions. And you can either do that through a question in the chat that I will read aloud, or you can raise your hand. And if you're not familiar with that, it's the um, you can do that in the uh, in the participants tab. And I will allow you to unmute yourself, and then you can ask the question. And then we'll have a few remarks by Diane Butler at the end, the director of the Binghamton University Art Museum. So that's how the structure is going to go tonight. And uh, as I as I mentioned, these are curatorial interns who have conceived, chosen objects, written labels, pl and planned layouts of exhibitions that are currently on view. But they did all of this work last semester, and so this is our opportunity to celebrate their work. If this weren't a COVID moment, the longest year ever on record, uh, we would be celebrating all together in the galleries. But I do want to encourage those of you that are Binghamton University students, faculty, or staff to come see the exhibitions in person. The museum is open to the Binghamton community, Binghamton University community, on Tuesdays through Saturdays, noon to 4 p.m. So we encourage you to stop by and check out these exhibitions and then the other ones that we have on view. So we're gonna go in alphabetical order tonight. And so we're going to start with Michael Mongaluzzo, who is an English major and his advisor was Joseph Church in the English department. So without any further ado, Michael, take it away. All right. Uh. Hello, everybody. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Michael Mongeluzzo. And uh, last semester, I worked on my exhibition, which I named Nameless Reflection, Protection, and the Doppelganger. Uh, so I'm going to kind of walk you through uh, the big idea and my process in working on this. Uh, like all the other curators, I started by looking through the extensive collection on Art Store. There's, I think, well over 3,000 pieces on Art Store. So trying to find pieces that were going to form a cohesive idea was daunting at first, but I quickly noticed that we had a lot of portraits and pictures of uh, just people with no names attached to them. And it got me thinking about how we could better relate to pictures and portraits if we don't know who that person is. And since I had just come off of uh, Psychological, psychological literature with uh, Professor Church, projection was really on the forefront of my mind. So when going through the pieces, I, it was important to me to have a very diverse range of pieces. I didn't want every single piece to look exactly the same. You're not gonna be able to project onto a piece if everything looks the same, you can't relate to it. So when I'm talking about projection, I I'm talking about the idea that we use our own experiences and unconsciously put them on to other things. So if there's a portrait of uh, a woman, you may relate to that through any number of experiences that you've had throughout your life. And my, the big question I had was, do we identify with these nameless pieces easier than those with names? So uh, an example I kept bringing up was if we saw a portrait of George Washington, we have preconceived notions about him. We would feel certain ways about him just because we know who it is. But if we don't know who these people are, how do we relate to those pieces? Is it easier? Is it harder? That's kind of what I was going for here. Um, and to go more into uh, projection and the doppelganger, 
uh, like I mentioned before, when there's limited information, projection is pulled from our own experiences. If you don't know anything about somebody, you're going to start thinking of things in your own life. You may be doing this unconsciously, but you're going to start pulling from your own life in order to make connections, especially when it's a human figure. You, we are social creatures by nature, and because of that, we want to make connections with other human beings. And for the doppelganger, uh, we all have the basic understanding that the doppelganger is someone that has an uncanny, like, familiarity. You know, it looks exactly like us. But in my exhibition, I, I changed it around a bit and took a more broader sense that the doppelganger isn't someone who has to look exactly like you, but rather you see the picture and you just feel like you know that person. You feel like that you can really connect with that person. Um, and going a bit more into the process um, with the labels, the panels, and the layout. So each um, piece has a label attached to it. Some of them have a very basic tombstone label, which is just information about the piece. Uh, so the medium, the name, the artist, time period, who, or how the museum acquired it. Um, so those were pretty easy to put together. The, all that information is on Art Store. We have great interns working to make sure all that information is correct. So thanks to them for making sure that was correct. Um, but for the labels with theory attached to them, that was a bit more difficult. In this process, I had to make sure that I was explaining these con complex uh, concepts in a less than complex way. I didn't want the information to be going over anybody's head. And it, this wasn't a process of dumbing it down because I don't want my audience feeling pandered to, but I want them to understand what's going on. So it was a very fine line of cutting out words that would need more explanation, fitting the right uh, word requirement, and making sure what I was trying to say was coming through in a coherent manner. And uh, my exhibition is situated in Gallery C, which is the biggest space in the lower galleries. And setting up all the pieces was, was a challenge for a couple of reasons. First, by the time uh, we got around to setting that up, we had gone home for the semester. This was after Thanksgiving. So I only got to see the gallery and the pieces a handful of times. So we actually used a program, the name of which is escaping me, to visualize the space. Um, and I had to make sure all the dimensions were correct so that pieces weren't like 12 feet by two feet or things like that. And setting everything up was, uh, it was difficult, especially because of the mirror. I will uh, go back here to the beginning. Uh, part of my exhibition was kind of just reflecting on yourself as well. Uh, that mirror was really the starting point and the ending point, but it's kind of hard with COVID to have a good flow. But I wanted people to look in the mirror, center themselves, remember what they look like, and hopefully that would help them relate better to these pieces. Um, but yeah, and as you can see in, in this picture, there's actually a piece that is in a little box. Um, that is this piece right here. And it's, I believe, the only photograph in the exhibition. And that was one that I was really drawn to from the beginning because all the other ones are, are portraits, uh, a vast range of mediums, but this one was specifically a photograph. And I thought that even though it's quite small, it would help people connect, I, I really thought. Uh, and so a few final reflections. Um, my, uh, this exploration really allowed me to see a completely different part of the museum world. I've been with the art museum for three semesters now, and I started as a social media intern, uh, was drawn to the curatorial internship because of some friends I had at the museum. And now I'm settled at an engagement and outreach intern. But this was really the deepest dive I think I had into the museum world. And lastly, uh, I wanted to give a big thanks to Professor Church, who could not be here, and uh,
Claire Kovacs, my supervisor, for all the help. I really could not have done it without their help. All right, thank you so much, Michael. Bravo. So um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. All right, should and, I stop sharing my screen or? Um, if it's your call. I mean, you may want to keep sharing it because you may want to um, refer to specific images as we as we go through these questions. So the first question is, how did you come to the idea of including a mirror? Uh, it was just a random idea I had one day. Um, like, like I said, I came off of a psychological literature class and we read all sorts of things. We read Poe, we read Hawthorne, a bunch of stuff. And I guess just kind of seeing yourself was something that was really important when it comes to projection and especially the doppelganger. And if you're going in with that rudimentary understanding of it, someone who looks exactly like me, well, you need to remind yourself what you look like. If you haven't seen yourself that day, I wanted to give someone a chance to be like, oh, that's what I look like today. All right, I'm ready. Thanks, Michael. So another question we have is, how did you decide which pieces had interpretation, the longer labels versus which ones didn't? Can you talk um, a little bit through that, that process? So it was kind of, it was a kind of twofold uh, decision. It was really the ones that I connected with personally, but it was also um, a spacing issue. I didn't want to front load labels or back load labels. I wanted to have it spread out so that you're not overloaded with information. Because at the end of the day, for me, while the labels were extremely important, I didn't want them pulling away the focus from the actual pieces. So if I spread them out and only put them on the ones that I felt like people could really connect with, I felt like that wouldn't have taken away from the actual reflection that you were hopefully engaging with while you went throughout the exhibition. Okay, thanks, Michael. So those are all the questions that are in the chat. If folks have questions and they wanna unmute themselves or raise their hands, I don't see any raised hands right now, but I think you might be able to just unmute yourself. Um, Diane, it looks like you are raising your hand, go ahead. Um. So I was intrigued that I think the only photograph in the exhibition is the little 19th century photograph. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So no, the, I, I'm going to jump in. It's not. There's also the um, the band. The, oh, the, yes, you're right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, there's sorry, the band. Yeah. OK, but that, too, is an older image. Yes. Which I thought was interesting that you would think a recent color photograph is going to elicit a more intimate response from a contemporary viewer than a photograph from you know the mid 19th century or even an image that is rendered rather than photographed so how did you settle down settle that out um so there were a couple things i when i'm going through the uh collections i didn't really see too many contemporary photos with no name attached to them. There was one that sticks out in my mind, which was of a family at a water park. And for that one, the reason I didn't include it was because uh, for me, the, the focus of that wasn't the people as much as it was the water park. That was the first thing I was drawn to. Mm -hmm. So um, when looking at the older fo photos, it them not having names and them just being portraits or group photos, um, I felt like that would help with reflection more. And also, since they are older photos, I thought that maybe people could relate to them in terms of seeing old pictures of relatives. Maybe they could connect with it that way and mm -hmm. kind of that idea. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Andrew. I have a question. Um, given that anonymity is an important part of this, I wonder if you could talk about how you perceive anonymity. In other words, you gave the example of 
uh, portrait of George Washington, right? Where everybody will see it and everybody will recognize that it's Washington, which takes us to kind of the other end of a spectrum. But there are shades of difference in between, aren't there? Where somebody is named or maybe only named with a first name. Um, and that person is still unknown to us in some way. And so I'm curious how anonymity works for you and how that projection that you want us to be thinking about applies at different stages on this spectrum between complete anonymity and complete notoriety? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so I guess starting at the far end of the spectrum of having a completely named person, um, kind of like how I mentioned with the George Washington portrait, having that person be known to us, I feel like it would be harder to project because of our preconceived ideas. Um, like I said, uh, someone might feel pride looking at a portrait of George Washington because they know who that is. Uh, but kind of moving down the spectrum with someone with just a first name, that also kind of gives us something to draw off of. Um, let's say this, the picture I have up now, I don't know this person's name, but let's say they were named John. You might start, start thinking about people named John that you know. And that is a way that you could definitely pull in uh, your experiences, but at that point you're doing it very consciously. So with the pieces I had, I wanted it to be more of an unconscious projection. You, I wanted people to feel almost a little uncomfortable that they are recognizing things and they're connecting with these things. It's not supposed to be, of like projection and a doppelganger aren't supposed to be like a, you're coming in with the idea of I'm going to connect with these things. I wanted it to be more of this person's completely anonymous to me. I shouldn't be able to connect with them at all, but for some reason I do, and I'm not quite sure how that makes me feel. So it's kind of that idea in terms of not including fully named portraits or even first named portraits. So it seems like there might be room for a, a companion exhibition that does something slightly different, like. Uh, an exhibition of portraits where the person, all of the people are called John, but we have no idea who they are. Or an exhibition where maybe as an experiment, as a psychological experiment, you took these images and you assigned names to them, even though we don't know who, what their real names were. Anyway, just something to think about. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Any last questions for Michael? All right, let's give Michael another round of applause. Thank you so much, bravo. All right, so we're ready to move on to our next presenter this evening, which is Morgan Mosley. Morgan is an anthropology major and her advisor was Carmen Ferradas. And Mar Morgan, it's you, this, the floor is yours. Okay. Take it away. I'm just gonna hide you guys for one second. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Morgan and I'm going to talk about my exhibition on triangular entanglement phot uh, photographer, subject, and viewer. Um, so what I want to do with this exhibition is kind of explore these relationships between the photographer, the subject, and the viewer. Um, how I started this process was first I just went and I looked at every single piece of, you know, object we had in our collection. And a few photographs uh, caught my eye and it actually made me think of this experience I had a couple of years ago at another museum where I saw these uh, photographs that showed really personal and explicit content. Um, one was showing drug use where the subject was just staring right at the camera. Um, and it, it felt very strange. I like I didn't know how to feel, and my friend and I couldn't stop looking at this. And I thought about how you know we take pictures, or there's pictures being taken of really vulnerable times, um, and how you know what are these relationships like? How does the viewer see this? Another time, another photograph I saw at the exhibition. Um, I remember being very angry because the curator, who I consider a viewer the label that they wrote, I thought was a strange interpretation of the photograph. Um, so I wanted to kind of explore these ideas. I also want to quickly talk about uh, my title, you know, Triangular Entanglement. 
So this was one of the hardest parts of this exhibition was trying to figure out what to name it. Uh, so I did what Claire told me, which I just wrote a list of anything I thought of. Uh, like 90% of it was just pure garbage and some of it wasn't even related, but I just had to write it because something I struggled with during this whole process was overthinking. Um, so this was an, ex an exercise to really help me with that. Um, and then I also did some Googling. I know I wanted to do something with like a triangle and I came across um, exposure triangle, which is a term in photography. I'm not a photographer, so I, I didn't really know anything about this. Um, but it's like these three variables that, de that determine an exposure to a photograph. So I kind of did a play on that. So I'm going to kind of take you through a tour and talk about some of the pieces, why I chose them, why I decided on the late, how I decided on the layout. Um, and then I'm going to pick a couple of pieces to really talk about. So right here are the two photographs by uh, Barbara Brooks Morgan. Um, and this is, these are very different than those in the rest of the exhibition. These two photographs are more of a, a collaborative effort. So you have two dancers, Pro Primus and uh, Martha Graham. And so the Pro Primus photograph, that's one of the first ones that really caught my eye because there was a type of like vulnerability I saw, but there was also strength. And I think something was great about this is you have these two dancers. So Martha Graham's uh, piece is about uh, mourning and Pro Primus is kind of about, you know, the African diaspora. Uh, and it's something very personal to them both, but they're the ones that are kind of controlling it and they're the ones working with the photographer to try and capture their work. And then the next wall, so I'm going to quickly talk about the layout, um, which so I had, I was very lucky to be able to look at the space that, you know, my, the pieces were going to be uh, before we kind of shut down again. And I was also very lucky to look at the works in person. So I kind of walked through the space. And then we used a 3D program, uh, SketchUp, which was also very useful. Uh, frustrating at first, but actually very fun to kind of explore and create. So these three works um, are by Donna Ferrado. And I am a big fan of her work. She became really known because she started capturing what it was like living in um, a relationship or a family of domestic abuse. And something that I think she captures really well is she's not necessarily taking advantage um, of the people involved. She kind of helps tell their story. Um, and also something about her photographs, I think are relatable, even if you have not been in the same situation. So these two photos, so on my left, um, which is like the mother and son in the middle, and then, um, I can't remember her name, but she is high-fiving her dog. And I think something that's really relatable about this work is these are people who, in a moment of chaos um, and really hard times, they find a moment of peace or they find a moment of joy. And then the photograph on the right, um, that's actually Donna Ferrado's parents. So she kind of brought her own experiences into her work. Um, and it's very clear what's going on in this photograph. Um, and she has talked about, you know, her dad being emotionally abusive. Um, and I chose a lot of these photographs because they kind of, I felt very connected to them. They made me think, they made me feel and relate. So I really also related to this photograph. And I also loved how Ferrado kind of exposed herself um, and her parents' relationship as well. Uh, this, the mother and son slept peacefully, is my favorite, one of my favorite photographs I've seen. And this is actually one of the works that also just really start, like kicked off what I wanted to do. Uh, I was a intern the semester before, um, but I was in collections. And we just got uh, this work and other Frado's works donated. And I had to like put it in the system. And I saw this and I just was taken by it. And after that, I went home and I researched Rado. Um, 
so that is, and then when I was going through the process again, I, you know, told myself, I really love this piece. I think I really want to use this piece. So on the next wall, um, we have works by various photographers. Uh, so on the left is Jacob Reese, which I'm actually just going to go ahead and just show right here. So Jacob Reese was kind of your founding photographer, one of the first people who really started to do uh, documentary photography. Uh, and he really exposed uh, really poor living situations in New York City. Uh, some of his practices are a bit questionable. I mean, this is the early 19th century. Uh, but something I, I wanted to like show, the reason why I picked this is it really contrasts the other works that I chose in a number of ways, especially the Ferrado. One with the Ferrados, we see a face, we know, we start to know the person, we see their story. Here, the subjects kind of more blend um, and they become part of the background. Uh, he's capturing poverty. So we don't really know these women, you know, who they are, what happens to them, which, you know, happens a lot in photographs, um, but they just kind of blend uh, into the background and more labeled as, you know, being impoverished. And then here's a work by uh, Marjorie Collins. So this is a later work. Um, a couple of the works I have are by the like photographers from the FSA. And I chose this work because it's very picturesque, uh, but it is someone, I mean, we don't know if this person had gave consent to the photograph. Um, I love this picture because it kind of has a Catherine Hepburn feel to it, but at the same time, it is someone just sleeping in their car in the middle of the park. Um, I'm gonna go back on this slide because I wanted to talk about a bit of the layout again and a bit of labels. So I, if, as you see, there's space in the middle. It's because I kind of joined the pictures into two. So this right here, they, what I wanted to do was complement them. So we have the one in the car by the other photographer, the photograph that shows someone sleeping. And there's actually a car, um, this is around the 1920s, very different than the one the other photograph as a reflection. So it does a nice complement. The other one with the Jacob Reese uh, shows like children also in kind of a rough living situation. So I wanted to complement that as well. And then here to the right, when I looked at this photograph and when I went and looked at my exhibition in person, I thought, wow, that those labels are enormous. Um, not all of them are super long and labels is something I really struggled with because I just kept overthinking um, and they took so much work. And I know every curator, like we worked really, really hard. We had so many people look at our work. We had so many edits we had to make. Um, something that was just really difficult was trying to articulate what you, you know, trying to get your point across and hoping that the viewers get it. Um, but I kind of had to let go the, you know, the worry of like, oh no, what if they don't get it? And just try my best and try to, you know, connect all the pieces and why these meant to me and why I thought they were important to put in the exhibition. And then on the last wall is uh, the Connie Hatch work. So she talks about gaze um, in her and these works. And so these photographs are actually paired. I'm gonna, so this is, so you can see them better. So three out of the four photographs, you actually have someone staring back at you. Um, and I chose this on purpose um, because to me, they're kind of, um, I mean, they're not only staring back at the photographer, but they're kind of staring back at the viewer and they're kind of exposing us um, that we're looking into their lives. And so this is, from the Connie Hash collection. So this was also one of like the top three pieces though I wanted to show this because this one really kind of also kicked off. Um, I think after seeing this, I kind of realized I wanted to do all photographs and I really wanted to talk about uh, these relationships. 
And then the last one, so when I picked the one I just showed you, uh, Claire was like, well, actually they come as a pair. And I was a little worried about that because you don't want another photograph that doesn't make sense to your vision. But then I saw this and I thought it was perfect. And it kind of goes in with my title, um, which is like triangular entanglement. And so as you see on my right, the man is kind of looks like he's checking out the woman to the left who's in her, you know, her own head or looking at something or someone else. And then you have the photographer, you know, notice, noticing it and neither one of them sees that. Um, so it kind of, you know, I thought create a triangle. And then my advisor, uh, Professor Faradas was like, well, it's actually kind of a square because you also have the viewer like looking at it. Um, but still it kind of <laughs> like really pushes the point um, and the ideas I'm trying to make. And then as my final reflections, uh, I really enjoyed this process and I honestly hope to curate another exhibition again. I, uh, for, you know, I've been in academics for about five years. I used to be uh, a very creative person, but sometimes academics doesn't allow that. So this was an experience that allowed me to, you know, put in, you know, my work as an anthropology student by like analyzing uh, research, which I love, but also to be creative. Um, and it was a really great experience. It was a hard experience. Um, and I had to think, Claire and Professor Faradas and Diane and also the other curators because we really did face a lot of challenges and I think the end result was really great. Thank you so much, Morgan. So we've got a, a question in the chat and so we'll start off with that one, which is the uh, the the question asker asked or noticed that all the photographs are black and white and wanted to know if that was a conscious choice on your part. Like, did you specifically look to black and white photographs? No, not really. There wasn't, I'm trying to think in the collection if there was a photograph that wasn't black and white. Um, I don't think so. Uh, so no, it, it wasn't a conscious choice. Uh, it just kind of happened that way. I will say though, uh, when I first chose my pieces, I actually had one work that was, I believe a painting uh, that kind of added to, you know, my point, but, you know, Claire and I were talking about the consistency. So that was a conscious choice to leave that work out. Thanks. Go ahead, Diana, see you unmuted. Um, so we know you're an anthropology major. And um, how do you think that major and the readings that you've done uh, in terms of how others have looked at the other informed your um, framing of this exhibition? So the last couple of decades, this is actually something anthropologists have been starting to do is um, how they view their subjects, what's their relationship with their subjects. They're kind of, they've been highlighting the pro problematic ways they portray their, you know, subjects for the last century. And I had a class before uh, that semester kind of talking about the history of, you know, anthropological thought. So I definitely think that was a big part. And that was kind of me just analyzing these relationships and you know, I've had to read so many ethnographies and kind of take them apart um, and kind of look at the biases. Uh, so yeah, that was a big help. And honestly, several readings I did were by anthropologists uh, that kind of talked about the other. Um, just as a follow-up, you mentioned some potential problematic elements of the Jakob Rees photograph. Um, were there others that you felt uncomfortable um, while selecting them or discussing their work? Well, I think that whole wall. So I first, something I did make a point in my intro panels, I didn't want this to be about what was good, what was bad. Um, 
whether that's just the photograph itself or the practice. More just having these questions and thinking about that. Um, and yeah, Jacob Reese is kind of difficult because when you do read about some of the things you, he did, you're kind of like, whoa, like trash. But you also kind of have to look at the good that came out of it. And also just like, I mean, that wasn't just him. It was kind of photography at the time. Um, it's the same with, you know, Dorothea Lang. I mean, people have questioned her migrant mother. Um, and I actually chose one of her pieces from that collection. collection. Um, but she herself like did some also really great things. So I don't know if I would say uncomfortable, but I recognized, you know, the work they did and the practices that they did. If that makes sense. Other questions for Morgan, you can either raise your hand, put them into the chat or just unmute yourself. So I'll have a I have a question for you, Morgan. So as you as you look back and reflect on the exhibition and the entire process that you uh, went through in constructing it, would you make any changes now? Um, is there anything that you would have done differently now that you've got a little bit more space? That's a dangerous question. No, um, when I first went to look at the exhibition, I really tried hard not to analyze everything. But I think the biggest, biggest change I would make is to not stress as much as I did. Because when I got closer to the end of my internship, I realized that I, I wasn't enjoying it for a while because I was so stressed out about the labels. And, you know, I talked to you about this, Claire, uh, issue that I have is... Um, so every time I wrote a new version of a label, like all the other curators, you know, our Claire, um, and then Diane later looked at it. And then also, you know, my faculty advisor, and I would look over my labels and I just kept critiquing it and thinking about what, you know, Claire might say, Claire's going to say this. And then I would treat it like it was actually said. And it literally was in my head. Like it was just like nonsense. So it kind of like tricked me up a bit. And I think I, I, I just made it harder for myself than it actually should have been. All right, we've got one more question. Um, so, so can you dig a little bit deeper into your critiques of Jacob Reese's work um, and sort of situate him not only in your critiques but also situate him within the cultural moment that he was working from? Um, I first want to say, and I hope I didn't say his work was trash. I'm going to say the things he did to capture his work uh, is, I don't think is something that should have been done. And I will go into that. So for example, the photograph that I showed you, you see like the white specks, um, you see the kind of blurry images. So he also, I believe, innovated uh, flash photography and what he did and he would just flash it wherever he was and this kind of startled um, those in the room and they had no idea what was going on. I also read uh, an article that said I guess he kind of worked with the police and I guess there was raids going on and something he would do was kind of get into these buildings in the middle of the night and just flash his camera while these people were sleeping and it startled them and it made them like leave their homes um, or run away. So I think that was, you know, kind of the bigger problems is at that time you didn't necessarily think of consent, you more just thought about your product, um, which is like strange because his whole point was showing poverty and how these people were struggling. But he also at the same time wasn't necessarily thinking about the individual when he was, you know, creating his work or capturing his work. All right, thanks, Morgan. Any other questions before we move on? All right, well, thank you so much, Morgan. Appreciate the work that you've done. So now we're gonna pivot again um, to Miranda Seaburn. And so Miranda, the floor is yours 
whenever you're, oh, well, I should actually introduce you instead of jumping into that. So Miranda's an art history major and her faculty advisor was Pamela Smart. Um, now really it's your turn to take the floor once you're ready to. Everybody. Okay. So I'm Miranda, like Claire said, and my exhibit is Women Through the Lines, Strength and Resilience. And so I'm, sorry, oh, I'm in the way again. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna start off talking about the process a little bit. So we started with forming the big idea and the checklist and that basically involved going through the whole collection like Michael and Morgan mentioned. And so I really didn't know what I wanted to do starting with. And so it was basically me picking images that I was drawn to and then subcategorizing them based on what I was seeing. And that was done with a lot of talk with Claire and with Professor Smart. And so moving on from there, I started researching the works that I chose and then writing the labels from there, which ended up being subject labels and object labels. And then after all of that, writing the exhibition panel and then the gallery layout. And so my big idea was photography and movement in the 20th and 21st century, focusing on strength and resilience through their portrayals as subjects and or through the artist's perspectives. And so going through the works in the collection, I ended up picking works in pairs. And so the pairs were by Barbara Brooks Morgan, Donna Ferrato, Hector Seabees, Cindy Sherman, and Dorothea Langs. And Dorothea Lang, sorry. And so it was a reverse process in that I didn't have something that connected them to begin with. It was more me pulling like threads after to connect them together. And so basically, all of the photos advocate for women to be perceived in their strength and resilience. And so there's also a collaboration in some of the images between the artist and the subject themselves that can be seen as a form of strength and resilience as well. So a couple of challenges that I went through, like I mentioned before, I was having trouble with the big idea to begin with. It was a lot of works to go through. And so I ended up having like subcategories of like flowers and like New York City and none of them were like what I really wanted to do. So then landing on this was really helpful and then I kind of ran with it when I kind of stuck with it. And so another challenge I went through was replacing the works. So Morgan has a pair of a photograph that we discussed that would be better for her exhibition. And so just sort of shifting things around from the beginning, it wasn't that hard, but also it did rattle me a little bit because I didn't really think it would happen, but it was okay. And so another challenge was writing the labels in general. So the process was very different from academic writing. And it was a issue, I was having a lot of problems with it. I don't really know why, but it was a big editing process, multiple drafts, multiple edits. Claire helped me a lot. Professor Smart helped me and also Diane helped me a lot. And so this is the gallery layout. Like I mentioned before, they're in pairs. And I, I also worked backwards in the sense that I thought of the works visually before writing about them. And so I kind of knew like how I was gonna situate them before even thinking about the labels in general and using SketchUp towards the end of the semester. I really liked that process, I think, cause I'm also a graphic design minor. And so that was something that I didn't really think about in general as like doing something as a part of curation, but I really enjoyed that process. And so I'm gonna take you on a little tour as well. So. On the left side when you walk in is Barbara Brooks Morgan and Donna Ferrato. And so I was drawn to the Barbara Brooks Morgans because I was a dancer. And so it was just something that I felt like a personal connection to. And for Donna Ferrato, the one on the right, that was actually the very first piece that I sort of picked when looking through art store. And so then finding a pair to match that. And so going into the artists individually for Barbara Brooks Morgan, She's known for her photographic collaborations with modern American dancers that capture the inner landscape of the dancers world. And so capturing elements of like fleeting performance moments as timeless gestures during the time of the Great Depression in the Dust Bowl. And so this is more of like a physical form of strength than the dancer themselves. And so on the top is Doris Humphrey and she was a pioneer in a group of second generation American modern dancers. And at the bottom is Pearl Primus. And she used artistic activism in her performances to present African 
dance to American audiences. And the pair of this photograph is in Morgan's exhibit. And so I'll move it on. For Donna Ferrato, the titles in this work play a large role in sort of tying together the strength and resilience aspect of when you look at the images at first, they seem innocent, but when you read the titles of the images, a truth is revealed as to what's happening in the subject's lives. And so the subjects, Margot and Mary, display a strength that empowers women through what they have been through and what they've done for themselves and for their children. And so Frado herself as a photographer brought violence against women to the forefront, which society tends to put on the back burner and not really talk about. And she hoped that by stating and revealing the unspeakable, that stories like Margot, stories of women like Margot and Mary would further enhance the safety for women. And so on the right side of the gallery, we have a Hector Asubi, Cindy Sherman, or Dorothea Lang. For in terms of being drawn to these works, I didn't have Cindy Sherman or Dorothea Lang in mind when I was going through like the first pass through. Claire recommended looking into them. And so then they were added after. And then for Hector Seavies, I, they were part of the original group that I had put together. And so for Hector Seavies, his approach in fo fo photographing women is obviously different from the women photographers in the exhibition because he's a man. And so he encountered these women's, he, he encountered these women on a photographic expedition to Africa in 1953 and the subjects express themselves in ways communicating their individuality. And this is more of a strength in the individual presence rather than like a physical strength or a bodily strength. And so his, his photography is unique in that at the time his portrayal of women in Africa or subjects in Africa wasn't through a colonial light, which is something that I was thinking about when putting together the exhibition, which is why I chose to include these pieces because I thought representation was important. So for Cindy Sherman, it is a different form of strength and resilience because when you first look at these photographs, they don't look like strong women, which is what Cindy Sherman's intention is. And these photographs are also not titled, which differs from the Ferrato, and then later when I'm going to talk about Dorothy Lang, where the title is an important part of the work. And so Cindy Sherman is also the subject in these photographs. So she takes on the role of both the subject and the photographer. So she engages with a persona that stems from filmic conventions that reveal society's judgment and stereotyping of women not being strong. And so the title lists photographs feed into an intention of talk, like looking at society's judgments about women and also turning it on the viewer because you have to figure out what's in the photograph and provoke your own questions as to what's going on, which also helps you look at your own biases towards women in a way. And so as an imagined persona, these subjects also differ from the rest of the subjects in the whole exhibit as in general. And so lastly, for Dorothy Elaine, she made a commitment to social justice through her photography and documenting workers to connect their situations to the world during the time of the Great Depression. And these two women can be seen in strength and resilience through their situations that they're in. And for the woman on the right, she can be seen in her physical strength in the work that she does as a farmer. And so the titles frame the composition of the images and allow the subjects in the work itself to not be anonymous. And so for the image on the right, the mother strength can be seen in her situation and in the strength of the everyday women and the moral strength of her portrait bears similarities to Dorothea Lange's migrant mother in which Lange hoped to showcase images, to showcase subjects as being worthier than their current condition and displays of pride regardless of their situations. So overall this process I think was a difficult one to say the least, but I think it was really rewarding in the end. I think during the whole process I was getting not upset, but like very like <laughs> uneasy about how things were going because I wasn't sure how people would perceive it. But I think now that everything is done, I think I'm really happy with it and the way it looks in the gallery when I got to visit. it. I also wanna say thank you to Claire, Diane and Professor Swan who helped me a lot throughout the whole process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miranda. Thank you.
questions for Miranda. As I said, you can put them into the chat. You can raise your hand. I can, you can unmute yourself. Um, give folks a minute to get their druthers about them. Go ahead, Diane, I see you've unmuted. Yeah, you mentioned when uh, speaking of uh, Hector Acebe's work that um, his was unique in that he's a male photographer, unlike the other examples were by female photographers. Mm -hmm. And you said, of course, it's going to be different. And I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit. I think regardless of gender identity, what you bring when you make art is different. I don't know if that makes sense. So like your personal experience is going to show through in your art, I think. That's just my perspective, I think. It's not something that I think is like necessarily backed up by something. But I think in general, it was a question of like, should I include him because he's not a, a woman photographer? That was a question that I had to grapple with. But ultimately in the end, I think in discussion with Claire, we decided that it was best to keep it in because the image outweighed that factor. Mm -hmm. And a difference in his um, ethnicity and the subject, mm -hmm. uh, you know, African subjects. How did you feel about that? At first, I, d I wasn't sure at first because I wanted to do the research before like completely omitting it. And so when I was doing the research, it did show up that at the time he was working with African photographers and going against the typical colonial perspectives of the time. And so that was not like a green light, but it was like, okay, like he was consciously thinking about it as he was working. So that led me to include him in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Miranda. Other questions for Miranda? So I'll ask one. Um, so you mentioned um, like there was, it was interesting because this is, I, I haven't been at Binghamton all that long. It's only been a year and a half, but I will say that this is the first time where I've had two students whose exhibitions have overlapped and we've had to work through in a, uh, consensus driven process whose whose exhibitions needed specific works because there was overlap in your interests. Can you sort of talk through you mentioned it in passing, but sort of talk through how maybe you would have seen your exhibition differently if those works or the work that you were interested in, in would have been included or just reflect on sort of how that had to shift your practice? I think that originally the route I was going to take was to, spe to focus specifically on Pearl Primus. So then when Morgan and I decided together that it would be better for her exhibit, I think I just had to shift it a little bit. It wasn't a lot, but I think in my mind, it wasn't something that was gonna happen. So then it wasn't something that I anticipated. So then it was a shift from focusing, instead of focusing on two people, I was gonna focus on three people for that section. Thanks, Miranda. There's another question from the chat, uh, similar to the question that was asked of Morgan. All the photos are black and white in your exhibition. Was that a deliberate choice? Was that something that just happened along the way? What are your thoughts on that? It wasn't a choice. Um, originally, I did want to include different media, but when I was looking through the question, there wasn't really, I think, it's actually in Michael's exhibit. There's like one painting, it's a blonde woman. I don't know the name of the exact title, but that was the one I had. But when I talked to Claire about it, we decided it would probably look better to just exclude it and then have a more cohesive look of all black and white photographs. But like Morgan mentioned before, I don't think there's any colored photographs of women. All right, great. Thanks, Miranda. Any last questions for Miranda? 
Oh, Morgan, are you trying to read? Oh, yeah, yeah I'll ask one. <laughs> um, kind of similar to what Claire asked me, um, is there anything that you would go back and try to change? I don't think so. I think maybe I would write a little bit less because when I did go visit, it was a lot of writing, which is something that I struggled with because in the beginning, we were going back and forth of whether there should even be labels or not. And ultimately we decided that there should be. And then it was a matter of a label for the artist and then a label for each piece. And so maybe taking a different route that way in deciding better how to write less, but also still get the message across. Um, I'm gonna do a quick follow-up um, on the labels because I myself had super long labels and you don't realize it until you actually see it. But I, you know, I edited so much, I assume you would. Do you think there like was a way where you could edit less? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, not. it's very tricky. Yeah, it's hard. And it was something that we struggled with in terms of layout, um, because as, as those of you that have seen the exhibition, Miranda's exhibition know, we ended up putting a Miranda's text in a, a booklet that you could look at as you walked around the gallery and just put numbers by each one of the labels. And part of that is because she was in a small space with a lot of work, um, you know, but that is <clears throat> something that we have to think about as we think about the viewer experience in the space, so. I just wanna say real quick, I actually really enjoyed that because I got to look at the exhibit without text and then I went back and looked at it with text and I thought it was like a really, I don't know, interesting and great experience. Um, I was just going to comment that it's not something that goes away. <laughs> I'm guilty that um, we have a recent acquisition up. It's a Jacques Kello print that I just couldn't help myself. It's a St. Anthony print. And there was so much to write about. And, and now I have this enormous label for people to read. So I encourage you to go and read the label and pick up the magnifying glass and look at all the creepy stuff he includes in there. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Diane. So let's give Miranda another round of applause. Thank you so much, Miranda. Thank you. And our last presenter for the evening is Livia. And Livia Zarg is an art history major and her advisor is Andrew Walkling. Livia is a little bit under the weather tonight. So she was, she had the fourth foresight, forethought uh, to record her uh, presentation. So if you give me just a minute, I'm going to stream it from my computer. I think we'll be okay, but if the if it gets a little glitchy, let me know and I will just pause and I'll just share with all of you the link. So just give me a minute to get this started. Hello everyone, my name is Olivia Zarge and I'm coming to you live from April 21st, 2021. I decided to record this presentation in advance because I knew there would be a possibility that I wouldn't feel 100% capable of presenting the day after my second dose of the COVID vaccine. So thank you all for your understanding and Dr. Kovacs for your flexibility. But looking back on my exhibition, it feels like ages ago that I was sitting in my dorm in, at three in the morning trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to create an exhibition about. I always had a love of Greek mythology and a desire to understand human nature. So after many different iterations of my big, my big idea, as one might call it, and trust me, there were many, I finally found a way to marry the two together. To begin, there was a realization that we as humans are selfish. We always are, and we always will be at our core. We are looking for and nothing more than the betterment of our own personal existence. And what better way to justify that than through the creation of gods who emulate those same traits? 
think sense equation in this push and pull, you might call it, the art we produce about those very same gods and tales is embedded with this corruption. And while there are many different causes of that same corruption, my exhibition focused on corruption when it was sparked by desire. So let's backtrack to those 3 a.m. nights I mentioned before. What was I actually doing staying up that late? Like many institutions, Binghamton Art Museum uses the art store platform as a means of digitizing their collection so that the public and students can view them online. I never really used art store before, so it took me a while to figure out how to navigate through and see Binghamton's collection. When I finally had it down, I put together my first checklist and I shipped it off, off to my supervisor, Dr. Kovacs. I would learn the next day that I had missed a key checkbox and instead of searching exclusively through Binghamton's collections, I had hunted through every single institution's collections, hence leading me to the alternative process as you see on screen. I went through everything, right? And then I had to reformulate everything in 24 hours. I put together a new checklist. I quietly cursed myself for not understanding the platform, but I came up with something new and I rather liked it. And I went about the process as I would always, just, you know, with 24 hours of chaos. <laughs> Before we get to talking about the key pieces in my exhibition, let's talk about how I arranged the pieces in the gallery. I was assigned Gallery A, which is a small rectangular room with three walls, which are usable for handy artwork. The fourth wall has, is mostly glass, so we're trying not to break that by putting nails in the wall. I had to take into account both the sizes of my pieces, as well as the color and the actual content within them. My pieces ranged from very small, so about the size of a stamp, to about a medium size, so a bit bigger than a large sheet of paper. And I didn't want any pieces to disappear into corners or pieces to seem redundant as if the content was exactly the same next to each other for no reason whatsoever. I ended up putting my key object on the wall opposite the en gallery entrance, so it would be the first thing that people see. So let's actually move on to the exhibition as I've talked about it enough, but I think you ought to see it so far. <laughs> I really like the way that these three pieces uh, from the exhibition come together as a whole. On the left, we got Celine and Endymion, by Bartomeo Guido Bono, excuse my translation, uh, pronunciation. In Greek mythology, Celine, the goddess of the moon, falls in love with a mortal, Endymion, and she becomes corrupted by her desires to love him and enchants him into an eternal sleep. Even though her desires are pure, she ultimately doomed an innocent man. In the middle, we have someone whose intentions were nowhere near as pure. This is Mythological Subject by Lovis Corinth. And while we don't know for sure who he meant to depict, the positioning of this woman's hands appear to follow the traditional positioning of Daphne, a nymph that the god Apollo relentlessly pursued until her father transformed her into a laurel tree. Apollo's lustful desires corrupted him, and while he goes on in his immortal life, Daphne's is cut short. She becomes a laurel tree. She can't do anything else after that. Finally, on the right, we've got Perseus and Andromeda, also by Lovis Corinth. According to the myths, Andromeda's mother becomes corrupted by her vanity, and the gods punish her by tormenting her kingdom with a sea monster. The only way to stop the monster, the oracle tells her, is to sacrifice her daughter Andromeda. Luckily for Andromeda, Perseus swoops in and rescues her from, the, from that very awful fate and slays the monster. In contrast with the other two pieces, neither one of the subjects depicted in Perseus and Andromeda receive as awful an end, and in terms of Greek mythology, they live as happily ever after as one can. It's now been about four months since I properly examined my exhibition and really reflected on the process and how it came to be. I think the best way to discuss my overall takeaways from the semester is to separate them into two categories, personal and professional. Personally, I had a massive reality check with the fact that my perfectionist tendencies some, and something that I'm not going to get on the first, I'm not going to get something on the first try, especially when it's brand new. I saw this firsthand when my original big idea went up in flames. All of my post-its that I had scattered around my desk, my little brilliant ideas about what I would write on the labels, gone, up in flames. And if I remember correctly, I gave myself about 20 minutes to be very frustrated, stare at my computer, be just very, very annoyed and angry with myself. But then I took a breath and got back to work. And I had to learn this despite all of the voices in my head telling me that I wasn't qualified to do this. Why on earth did the Binghamton Art Museum let a student do this? And why did I even think from the very first moment that I was interested in this, that I was capable of putting together an exhibition? But eventually I realized that 
I am capable. I developed an exhibition from scratch. I put my heart and soul into this, even if this content wasn't my original plan or my original idea. Sometimes mistakes happen and better things come out of them. Professionally, I learned more in one semester about museums than I ever have before. First, I learned so much more about what it actually takes to curate an exhibition. Before last semester, I had only ever laid eyes on the final product, the polished labels, the galleries that seamlessly flowed from one to the other. When I took the time to go through each element from the checklist to the intro panel, so even picking out a title, I gained an appreciation for just how much work goes into curating each exhibit. So much time goes into the process because every little, de little detail from the wording to the layout holds importance. If you make your label too long, people will lose interest. If you make it too short, they won't learn what you want them to learn. Second, I developed a deep understanding of what role I will play in the changing museum culture and, culture and structure in the future when I graduate. A great deal of our readings from the, the class portion of this internship focused on the deeply embedded racial inequality and racism that can be found in so many major art institutions. It's horrible that we're only beginning to take big steps towards this fundamental change and removing that and replacing it with equality and equity and acceptance of everything and appreciation for everything. But I know that I have to continue this and push for even more change. Throughout the process of this, going through this classwork and curating this exhibit, I had to reckon with my own personal preferences in art and why I chose to create an exhibition about mythology. I've always gravitated towards European Greco-Roman art, but why? It's because as a child, I learned that this is what the elite standard was and that's what I internalized and I still hold in some not so great ways today. I don't have the same appreciation for African art and Asian art because that just wasn't what I was taught. The museums that I visited at the very forefront were the look at our beautiful sculptures that we have from Greece and Rome. But if I wanted to see the Benin art or if I wanted to see Buddhist art, I would have to go not to the basement, but not to the galleries that were as easily accessible as the, the room that held a 13 foot Roman statue. I have these unconscious biases as well as so many other people. And we have to work on changing that and bringing toward a greater future, a better future. So finally, I would like to thank the following people. Dr. Kovacs, who served as my supervisor for this internship and helped a very, very naive art student from the very beginning to the very end. Professor Walkling, who was my faculty advisor, and as the title suggests, provided advice that surely saved my exhibition from crashing and burning on the floor. And last, but certainly not least, my classmates from Art History 492, the internship class. Each one of them gave their own insights to the discussions, which only further reinforced my knowledge of the fact that the museum industry is a collaborative industry. Each one of us relies on one another and we can't get anywhere by ourselves. If I had been left alone to do this exhibition, I probably would have given up within the first week, maybe even the first few days. And finally, again, thank you to everyone who came here and took the time to listen and learn about my exhibition as well as my fellow curators. Thank you so much, Livia. And uh, so Livia is here with uh, here and happy to answer questions. And I see that Andrew has his hand raised, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, first of all, Livia, congratulations on getting your vaccine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I got it as soon as I could when I got back from being home for Passover. Good, good. Um, uh, so uh, I obviously I enjoy working with you. Uh, very much. And one of the things that comes out of your presentation is the kind of the learning experience that you went through in order to uh, in order to arrive at this point. Now, you're a junior. And so I'm just wondering, how would your next exhibition go? And what would you do for that differently? Building on what you've learned? <laughs> Well, I would definitely make sure to check that checkbox on Art Store. Just solve that problem right out the gate. Um, I don't know. I mean, since I completed that exhibition, I've had random ideas go from the top of my head that I was like, maybe I'll like look into this, maybe I'll look into that. I created actually a few groups on Art Store just 
in case I decided to really, you know, throw myself back into it. Um, I think, I don't know, I think I would give myself, I will hopefully if I didn't, uh, if I get that checkbox, I'll have more time so it won't feel as rushed for myself because you know, those first putting together the checklist and like starting with my labels, I felt very behind because I didn't have, you know, like a few weeks of really ruminating on my big idea because my original one went out the window. <laughs> So we have a, a question in the chat that sort of jumps off of that. I'm sorry, Andrew, if you had a follow up, you can you can jump in. But uh, so there's a question about uh, what was your original idea? Uh -huh. And would you be willing to share that with folks? Yes, totally happy to. Um, I wanted to talk about medicine and the values that of the how do I put this? I had a post a note on my desk about this that I finally took down. But uh, spring of my freshman year, I took a class called um, Pre-Modern Medicine and Disease. And a lot of, every once in a while, we would talk about art that was also produced dur during certain, certain medical innovations. Like there was a five-lobed liver and there'd be, you know, art of people with five-lobed five livers and the system of the brain, the heart and the liver, the three most, which were viewed as the three most important organs. And I really thought that it'd be cool to understand what the values people had were based on that art. So there, there uh, in the original groups, there's pictures, uh, maybe woodcuts of dissections, of uh, all sorts of things like that. But um, I later learned that all of my work did not come from Binghamton's collection. Olivia? Other questions for Olivia? Go ahead, Dan. We saw um, for Morgan and Miranda, especially their emphasis or their landing in photography and your exhibition did not include any photography, which was good because we were running out of frames for that. <laughs> but also I was wondering if the medium made any difference to you, you know, whether it was, I noticed lithography and drawing, um, to what extent did the artistic process um, influence you, if any? Um, I would really say it only really influenced me when, at the very beginning, when I made my first checklist for this new version, uh, I had a couple uh, dimensional image. I had a small statue. There were a set of vases. And I think it was while I was talking to Dr. Kovacs where I was like, you know, maybe this will really draw away and become the focus of the exhibition when I really want the focus to be the drawings and the lithographs. Um, the, the actual differences between everything that was 2D really didn't uh, hold much significance to my exhibit. It was just, it made more sense to keep it all consistent. Thanks, Livia. Other questions for Livia? And why don't we give her a round of applause? Thank you so much. And, uh, and, and thank you for being willing to answer questions live. Um, and thank you for recording your presentation ahead of time. You are a very good planner. So I appreciate that. So before I hand it over to Diane, I just wanna thank some folks before, before I do. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the presenters this evening. I wanna thank the rest of the curatorial it, or, or the it, the Binghamton University Art Museum intern. So as the students have suggested this evening, they were just one part of a larger internship class and an internship program that we've been doing at the Binghamton University Art Museum for the past three semesters. So that's been really exciting. And I've, I've really loved watching the different dynamics that are happening with people speaking across their internships and the whole point of the program is to get people together in the room and talk about how museums aren't just these various silos, but how we all work together. So I've, I've really appreciated that. And, and there's been some uh, intimations this evening of, of how that, that played out in the real world in the fall. So I, I just wanna thank them. I also wanna thank the rest of the staff, the faculty advisors and the, uh, the interns at, for putting all of this together. As the students have mentioned, this no one curates an exhibition, you know, isolated. You know, this takes a, a village, so to speak, to put together. So thank you all for 
all of your work, both what is in front of the scenes and behind the scenes and getting this all together. So thank you so much. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Diane to close us out. Well, thank you, Claire. And thank you all for your presentations. It's always a pleasure to see uh, the myriad directions people take and what gets a little airtime, um, pulling things out of the vault and seeing things on the walls. That's why we have such a wide ranging collection and it's really nice to see you all engaging in that. Um, I have an additional thank you. Um, that is for Maya Kalman, who designed all of the intro panels for the, the exhibitions. Um, she really dug in and read your labels so that it would inspire the design that resulted. And, and it's always a challenge because you want it to, co to complement without ever upstaging what you're doing. And so she really enjoyed that, that process. So um, I wanna thank Maya for that. I also have the privilege of announcing uh, the Dory Knoll Student Curator Internship. Uh, this was established by Binghamton University alumna, Jerry McDonald, in memory of her mother, who was a lover of the arts, Dory Knoll. And um, in order to come upon the, um, the awardee, um, I always consult others because even though I haven't shepherded you through the process as Claire has, I do get involved and I don't want my own prejudices to, to influence it. So um, I have some comments for each of you um, before telling you um, where, where we landed. So for uh, When Corruption Met Desire, and I will be reading these comments just so you know I'm not speaking extemporaneously. <laughs> In this jewel box exhibition, Livia reminds us of the ongoing power of myth to narrate the complexities of human desire, asking us to pay focused attention to a selection of prints and drawings spanning several hundred years. She draws us close to the dual nature the ambivalence of eros. And for triangular entanglement, through a carefully chosen range of photographs placed in a thoughtful dialogue with each other, Morgan calls attention to the fundamental geometry of looking, the equilateral relationship between maker, viewer, and subject. Made aware of our own embodied gaze on these images, and of the hidden gazes of those who held the camera, we are made productively aware of the complex power dynamics that structure these photos. And for nameless reflection, it is a fundamental human tendency, Michael argues, to project ourselves into the people we see in artworks, in the watercolor, the print, the photograph, we see distorted mirrors of ourselves, our doubles. Mon semblable, mon frère, as Baudelaire famously put it. Offering us a range of types observed by artists, his exhibition asks us to consider this key psychological trope. Who do we see when we look at the human image in art? And for Roman, women through the lens, Five women photographers looking at other women through their viewfinders. 10 photographs that Miranda argues portray the dignity and perseverance of their female subjects. We are bombarded daily with images that objectify and demean. Here in this tightly focused exhibition, we are reminded of the photograph's potential for empathy and connection. So I want to congratulate you all on what was an arduous process and ask you to join me in congratulating Morgan Mosley for being awarded the Dory Knoll Student Curator Internship. So congratulations, Morgan. Uh, thank you so much. I did not expect that. I really appreciate it. And I, for I forgot the name of the person that donated or the right. person, the award, name of the award. Dory Knoll is, is the woman who in whose honor it's made. Um, and Geraldine uh, McDonald, uh, the alumna 
is is the person who made this endowment so if you are if there's any way i can contact them i would i you know thank you so much i really appreciate oh. it very good she'll be seeing this recording <laughs> all right back to you claire all right well i think that I don't know where else we're going to go. So I think that's a high note and we should end there. So thank you all. Congratulations, Morgan. Congratulations to all of the interns for all of your hard work. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this evening. I hope that you continue to engage with other components in the Binghamton University Research Days. Have a wonderful end of your semester and a wonderful evening. Good night. Bye -bye.